a lot of what I play is improv, especially with the sitting in and stuff. It, that happens 90%. If I'm sitting in with somebody, it's 90% improv. I'm going off of what I hear and what I feel and what I hear the changes going and what I hear them coming back to and what I want to put there. So it's mostly improv what I do. Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. In the show, I interview innovative peak performers. I talk with entrepreneurs, business owners, and creatives who are pushing the envelope to work creatively and authentically. We explore how to cultivate innovative genius to achieve our visions to succeed. This week's show is brought to you by my book, Speak From Within. If you need to communicate better and leave your listeners riveted, you'll want to check the book out. And now, let's get to it. Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am super thrilled you're here. I'm also incredibly delighted to welcome this week's guest. Joey Williams is a Grammy Award-winning vocalist and guitarist. Since the early 90s, he's been part of the legendary gospel band, The Blind Boys of Alabama, and he's also played in other bands along the way, like with Robert Randolph and the Family Band. He's also a sought-after R&B session musician who plays with many of the world's other great musicians. I was lucky enough to meet him and his lovely wife, Monica, at the inaugural show of the Sophisticated Psychos Experience here in New York City. So I'm honored to call him a new friend as well as one of the great guitarists. It's my pleasure to know. I'm so thrilled to welcome Joey Williams. Welcome, Joey. Hi, how are you doing today? (laughs) I'm doing, I'm doing great. It's a beautiful, beautiful sunny day here in, in New York City. So I'm ridiculously pl- pleased to be here. And I'm so happy that I'm getting a chance to chat with you. I want to thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor. <laughs> You're so fabulous. So I want to, <laughs> I, I want to start at, at the beginning. Okay. What what got you started playing? What drew you to music? You're an artist, you're a creative soul. You could have gone other ways, I'm sure, but what, what was it about music that got you and started you down this road? Well, um, I come from a musical family. My father was a musician. He uh, played guitar and sang. And he had music all over the house, you know, all around the house all the time. Mm-hmm. So I started hearing music at a young age, and then I was banging on stuff around the house, banging on chairs and and pots and pans, you know, and my mother had to deal with that. So my father brought me a snare and a cymbal, and I was playing snare and cymbal. That was my drum set, and I was really into music. Um, You know, I just wanted to be like like a musician or something because, out of the snare and cymbal, I would take every piece down. I would unscrew every part of the stand, the snare stand, and then I'll take the cymbal stand down so make it seem like I'm doing so much and like I have a whole drum set. <laughs> so it started back then. <laughs> and then my father, uh, later on, a few years later, got me a, a guitar and told me, you know, I'm glad you play drums, you know, because I used to go out and play for his quartet group and, and his friends that were on quartet shows back in the day, I would bring my snare and cymbal and I would be the only drum type thing. Cause back then we didn't have drums really. It was mm. just like, you know, guitar, you know, just guitar and maybe guitar and bass or something like that. But the quartet group back then didn't have drums really. So I would be like the drummer guy, you know, a little boy just playing drums. So I would bring the snare and cymbal and I would play for a few of the groups there. And later on, my father brought me a guitar and he told me, you know, drums are good, you know, but there are a lot of drummers. So I need you, you know, I want you to learn how to play guitar now. And so I started playing guitar after that. And um, at a young age, I guess about, I guess, uh, eight, nine, ten or something like that, because I was doing the drum thing at like three or four. Oh, my stars. So I. yeah, yeah. So I was like playing, you know, standing up. I would stand up and play, you know, not be able to sit down. Um, and it went <laughs> on in my family, my brother. Because you were too thing. short. You know, I got pictures of him. <laughs> too short to sit down, yeah. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. So uh, do you remember 
when you were that young, when you were four or five years old and you're playing drums with, <laughs> I can't believe it, with your father's quartet, did you ever have trouble like finding the beat? I mean, the drummer is the keeper of the beat. So did you ever have trouble with that? Or were you just able to figure out what needed to happen? Like, where did you, where did that, you know, you can say it's a gift from God. That's, that's one thing, but where did the, the musicality come from that allowed you at such a young age to be able to play, perform and be in the pocket with a bunch of adult musicians? Well, like you said, definitely without a doubt and 100% a gift from God hmm. because like um, also like you said you know it's hard to do but just to you know to go sit in you know with somebody and play along with them but I think having my father's background and in, in his you know genes running through me <laughs> I think that was a help because I wasn't worrying about that once I got there because once I left the house you know going there I knew I can play I had already played along with um groups on on like the their um we had 45s and, and albums and mm -hmm. I would play along with them I would play that and then I play old groups like the Swan Silvertone you know and this like I would play along with them mm -hmm. and play along with all these artists or gospel artists mm -hmm. you know like Blind Boys and Nightingales all these people and I would just play and I would be the drummer for them mm -hmm. at my house, you know, in the basement. I would just be the drummer playing for all these, you know, groups as a little boy. So when I went out with my father, you know, uh, he knew that I could play for other people. And, he, and I would play for his group, his quartet group. And then they heard me playing with them. And then they would ask my father, could he play for us? Huh. And, uh, yeah. So he would, he, he would go, yes. And then I would play for the next group. You know, and these were you know, Brooklyn, you know, kind of Brooklyn quartet groups. Oh, that's so fascinating. So word spread, word of mouth that you were, that you were someone that they wanted to play with. And, and I'm sure it was also such a wonderful novelty having this little boy being, <laughs> being the drummer. I, I guess so. Yeah. And I didn't even think about it like that. Um, I was just so happy to be out and be playing, mm -hmm. you know, and doing that. It was just so exciting to me. So I didn't, you know, I didn't think twice about it, you know, but uh, the drum thing, it didn't last too long ago mm -hmm. you know that you know that just maybe a you know a year or two i was doing that and the next thing you know i was you know playing the guitar and so, he had me doing the same thing so let me let me ask you a question i started playing violin when i was five years old and played for years and then stopped and then took it back up again but that when you're a child i know that you were happy to play which i think is amazing but when you're a child I remember playing the violin and it, it felt correct. You know, it felt right to me when you switched from drums and guitar, did that, how did that feel? Did that feel right also? Or was there a transitional period when you had to go, okay, I have to stop this one way of making music and begin this other. Well, yeah, I, I was a little taken back because I was, you know, I was kind of loving the drums thing, you know, Mm -hmm. So I was kind of, you know, taken back, but then he, you know, not insisted, but he convinced me that, you know, you can still play drums and you'll be able to play drums. He said, but um, as far as like traveling and, you know, I like to travel and play with people and stuff. He said, as far as that, you will be able to get more gigs and do more things if you can play guitar and drums. He said, and there's a lot of drums, there's more drummers than there are guitars. Hmm. He said, so um, you should definitely learn how to play, you know, bass and, and guitar too. So um, I would, you know, I would do it, I would do it. And then it eventually grew on me. I would learn more chords. I would listen to those same albums, um, you know, back then, you know, back then mm -hmm. that I was playing drums to. Now I'm playing the chords um, to them as well. And I'm listening to, you know, old cats, Dixon Hummingbirds and Gospel Keynotes and Mighty Thousands of Joy, all those kind of artists as well. So I'm playing the chords with them mm -hmm. where I, like a couple of years ago, I was playing drums. You know, I was their drummer. Now I'm their guitarist and I'm sitting in with them now. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's incredible. Yeah. So, okay. 
Um, and, and I know we're, we're really in the weeds. We're in the nitty and the gritty of this, but there's something so fascinating to me about youngsters playing music, discovering it so early. And I know obviously guitar and, and music in general has shaped your life, but how do you think it shaped, shaped your childhood? Like what was, how, how different was your childhood from some of the other kids in your neighborhood or some of your friends? Well, music kind of, I don't want to say saved me, but it kept me from doing some of the things that I would have been doing that wouldn't have been as cool or, you know, as good for me, Mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, like, uh, when guys wanted to go out and do mischievous things, you know, I would be home trying to learn my, you know, learn the new chords that, you know, my father was teaching me or learn the new chords. Besides the fact that I couldn't go outside and, you know, hang like that anyway. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it wasn't like I was, I can just, you know, jet out there at like 11 or 12, you know, like, you know, and just go hang out with my friends and do whatever I wanted to do. Mm Wasn't like that. But, when I got, even when I was like becoming a teenager and they were going out and doing things, I, um, I would be inside and um, me and my cousin Cloud, oh, Cloud, we call him, but Kevin Cloud, he would stay in and we would be a band. And we even had my little brother who was then maybe, I don't know, 10, you know, or, or you know, maybe five or 10, something like that. And we would, instead of him going out and playing with his friends, we would make him be the drummer for <laughs> us and stay inside with us. And he had to stand up and play drums as well while he was playing. <laughs> so, yeah, it kept me out of um, a lot of things that I, you know, could have been into. But uh, music, you know, it kind of t- took me in another direction, mm-hmm. which I'm glad about today. Oh, absolutely. I completely understand what you're talking about. For me, it was musical theater, which I discovered in high school and everything became about singing and musical theater and everybody else was doing whatever it is they were doing. I was in, I was in the theater in rehearsals every day after school, if I wasn't at work, you know? So, so there was this focus to my life and it made it a lot easier to, to keep keep going because that's what I wanted to do. And when you were, when you were a teenager and, you know, some of the other things that were, like you said, you you know, you weren't going out and getting into trouble, but were there other things that, that drew you that you might've wanted to pursue that you didn't, or was music always it once you started down that path? Really music was kind of always it, you know, I was hanging in the, you know, park around the corner from the house and, you know, I would try to play basketball, you know, and by mid game, you know, I'm joking around with everybody or, or maybe singing a song or something like that during the thing. So I was never, you know, really good at sports. I liked sports. I love sports, you know, but I just wasn't as good at it as music. Mm-hmm. So um, nothing, I, nothing really, nothing else really kind of stepped in the way and was trying to pull me away from music or that I had any kind of passion for besides uh, music to be, you know, to be honest. You know, it's funny because I, I really do believe that we are sort of divided between being specialists and generalists and generalists are pretty good at a lot of different things. Uh, but they're not amazing or great at any one. And specialists are, you know, you found the one thing that you are amazing at. And for you, it sounds like music is it. You're, you're a music specialist. And that is, as far as your personality, that's, that's how it is. And that's what it is. And I I think that's so, um, in some ways it's, it's reassuring because you know, your thing, you know, (laughs) you you don't have any doubts about it. (laughs) So, yeah, that, you know, yeah, I do love that. And I mean, I'm not saying that I wish I hadn't pursued other things in life, you know, because uh, a lot of those things, you know, become important mm-hmm. later on. But um, it's just, if I just, you know, being honest, that was the main focus of, you know, my life, getting, you know, getting into music, making new music, you know, kind of, you know, finding new chords, finding new 
avenues, going on the road, you know, playing in front of people. You know, my big goal in life was to have a dressing room to myself and do a sound check. You know, those things were, were big in my life that I wanted to do, you know, both and then and play a song where when I hit the intro, the people would know the name of the song, no matter who, not just my hit song, but anybody. If, mm-hmm. you know, those things were, you know, just big in my in my mind. And and they're you know, and it just it just keeps supporting my premise that 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 this is it for you. This is the focus in many ways of of your entire professional life. It's like, okay, that's what it is. And so that leads me to my next question. A lot of people keep a day job and then do a side gig with their music and then, you know, maybe eventually make music their career. How did that flow for you? Did you ever have a day job or was music, did you just go straight music and that was the only thing? Um, I, I, I went straight. I mean, I was with my, my father's group as a youngster. I mm-hmm. turned, I turned 11 years old on like a mini tour uh, in Florida. Mm-hmm. If, to me, it was a major, you know, tour. It was just like a, a, a world, a <laughs> world tour. Of course. But, uh, yeah. So I turned, so I was, at, I was 10, I turned, I spent the birthday down there in Florida for a week and I turned 11 there and I've been on the road kind of ever since. But um, once I... Once I got of age, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What was the question again? <laughs> did you ever have, essentially, did you ever have a day job or was music the professional part of your life the whole time? Okay, right, right. From then, you know, I was still in school then. So, yeah, I had, I was on the road uh, first. My father opened a store called Joe's One Stop. It was in Brooklyn. Shout mm-hmm. out Ralph Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> we had a store. Yeah. So it was called Joe's One Stop. Uh-huh. And um, that was sort of my, job first job but it was the store so it was kind of our store and I was kind of put in charge of it and from there I went on the road with the you know with the gospel group from the uh, gospel airs and from there I came off the road and was kind of down south down in North Carolina with my parents and then um cousin Kevin Cloud called me and asked me that I wanted job with Slim and the Supreme Angels. And that was back in the eighties as well. Uh-huh. And so I hadn't worked yet, so I'm going to that job. And I'm, I did about a year or two with that band in the eighties, maybe 85 or so. And after that, I came home in 86 to New York. And that's when I got my first job because, you know, I was off, but you know, I didn't have any, my jobs as a musician were always on the road. Mm-hmm. So I didn't, I didn't have any New York connections where I can just go and do my musician thing in New York, you mm-hmm. know, play clubs and all this. I had, you know, zero, you know, contact like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I wasn't the one that's going to just be a musician and, and no matter what <laughs> and can't eat. So I got a job at, um, what was I doing? A, a grocery store, like Food Emporium. Mm-hmm. And I was there for, I guess, a year. So, and I would do gigs and, and come back. And I wound up being the produce manager at Food Emporium. And um, I would go away and come back. And then I got I got an um, offer from the gospel keynotes um, who I had, was going out on the road and coming back, going out on the road, coming, going back. And they um, offered me a job. And I went to the Bahamas with them. and. From then, I came back and told the you know food emporium that I was going to move on, and um, I did that. But before food emporium, I was was it before or after? Somewhere in there, I was also working at Sears. And so those are the two jobs that I had: Sears and food emporium. And I was going back and forth, like playing, and that was you know i was signing autographs on the weekend and then doing um <laughs> doing the produce during the week or whatever it is you know maybe sweeping up the uh, getting ready to open up because i was wind up being a produce manager and uh, in hardware at sears so those are the two jobs that i had so i was never you know 
afraid of working because you know if it if i if i need to work i work but i'd much rather spend my life playing and making a living playing and that's what i did after that and that was back in i guess that was the end of the 80s or 90s something no it was um the end of the 80s i guess that was my last um last job working maybe in the 90s you know what's really interesting about what you just said you said that was my last job working because i would have much rather been playing music and it sounds to me like playing music <laughs> doesn't feel like a job you know it doesn't feel like work can you talk about that for a second like what is it is it just like this is just joy and i haven't worked a day in my life since then or what what is what is the difference to you between the work of something like Sears and and the Food Emporium and and being a plumber or whatever to being up on stage and 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 playing and being on tour or whatever like what where why is there a divide there between the two that one is work and the other one seems to be play um it could it could be because i just i love it so much that mm -hmm. that may be the reason why i you know phrase it that way you know but i didn't mean you know you know, I didn't mean it in any particular way. I just, you know, that's, you know, that's just how I said it. But yeah, it feels like when I'm on stage and I know it's work, especially now after been, you know, after doing it for all these years. Mm -hmm. So I definitely know it's work, but um, I guess having to do something that I don't want to get up in the morning and do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, not it's not just to getting up in the morning because you know I get up many mornings at five in the morning to catch a seven o'clock flight. Mm -hmm. So it's not the getting up in the morning, but it's different getting up in the morning and going somewhere that either you don't want to go, you know, or where mm -hmm. you don't want to be, mm -hmm. or something you don't want to do, mm -hmm. being around some people you don't want to be with, and having no choice about it, you know. Right. You know, right. You know, so those things that could be that could be it. But my explanation for myself is maybe because I love it so much and maybe it just doesn't feel like work, especially in, in comparison to, you know, as you would say, a, a regular nine to five. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting. There's that saying, you know, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And right. And, and 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 I agree with that, but I'm really glad you said what you did because because it is work. Being a creative professional, which you are, is it takes work. It's just the per yeah. perception of it. Your perception, it sounds like, is that it, it it just doesn't. It's work, and I know it's work, but it feels so wonderful to do that it just doesn't feel like that kind of work, you know. And I think that's fascinating. That as a creative professional for all these years, you you just you love it so much that yeah this is if i'm gonna have something i want to do this is the thing you know and i think that's that's amazing and wonderful uh and I'm, I'm really glad you articulated that because because i think there are a lot of people out there who want to be creative professionals you know who might do something like in in their bedroom and might play guitar but might be too afraid to really try for it. And I hope that that was inspirational to anyone who heard it, because it was inspirational to me as someone who's done music professionally for so many years. Uh, and I, so I thank you for that. So the next question I have, and this is something that, this brings me to my next question, is I'd love it if you would talk about how you started working with the Blind Boys of Alabama, because you went, you went from these other gigs and the this other way of of doing music with your dad and other bands and then you started this decades long association with the blind boys of alabama i would love it if you could talk about how that all came to be and what led you to joining this legendary band well um like i said before i had left my work going you know i was with slim and the supreme angels and then i went back home and then I got with Gospel Ez, went back home. Then I got with the Gospel Keynotes, went back home. <laughs> and then- I see a pattern here. <laughs> I see a pattern, right? So then they, um, I, while I was home, I was 
I was there at home just, you know, pining away, but still wanting to play. And then um, an artist, gospel artist, Shirley Caesar, you know, I went out and played for her because she was in New York and she offered me a job to go then, but then, you know, I discussed it, you know, with Monica and then um, we just um, decided not to do that. But then within the same month, uh, the Mighty Clouds of Joy um, called me and I took that gig. And while, while on that gig, I was there for maybe a year, something like that. And while on that gig, we ran into the Blind Boys of Alabama a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Once, at, once at the Ravinia in Chicago. And I was amazed that um, they were able to um, follow us because Mighty Clouds of Joy, you know, big in the, in the um, gospel world. You know, so I was you know, amazed that they were able to, you know, follow us and close the show and all the people were still still there. So I'm looking at that, I'm like, wow, okay, they're still hanging because you know we didn't hear a lot about them on, on that side of the quartet world. Mm-hmm. And we were with them again in Irvine, California. That's when their tour manager came to me and asked would I find them a guitarist because they need a guitarist. And I said, okay, I'll do that and I'll be back in touch with you. And I went back home and did some research on the guys and long story short, I came back to them and said, I found the guy. And that was in 92. Mm-hmm. And I said, I found the guy and the guy's me. <laughs> and um, <laughs> when should I stop? So I went out and did an inter- uh, interview. I mean, a, like an audition, but it was mm-hmm. like a live audition. Mm-hmm. And my, uh, my godmother, Cora, we rode out there together to this church and blind boys were playing at the church Mm -hmm. and I went early, uh, Cora and I, and said, we'll just be there early. And I do a little, you know, meeting with them and talk. Well, that night they told me, well, not that night before the show, they said, um, well, you can have the gig if you want, but, um, you'll play tonight, you know, as a, like an audition, Mm -hmm. but it's like a live performance but audition and I said okay yes and I went back home this is a side story I went back home I mean I went back to the phone because we didn't have cell phones then so I went Uh to a phone booth and I called Monica and I told Monica I said well I think I'm going to take the gig um with the blind boys and she said okay well then um what are they uh what are they going to pay you I said well they they offered me um a thousand a week or a percentage and she said okay all right well I guess you know thousand a week you know it's not bad you know you want to be out there I said well I took the percentage she said what <laughs> <laughs> she said oh you have a family oh my goodness um we need you know you got to be stable and I said yeah but um look I know this thing as you know I you know you're you're with board of education I'm in music I said, you know, just, you know, I'm going to roll the dice here. And needless to say, it was the right move because, um, you know, from then to now, you know, it's been many more <laughs> dates and much, you know, more than that could have ever, uh, <laughs> that could have imagined. And her as well. So <laughs> she took my word for it. <laughs> but that's how I got uh, with the Blind Boys uh, at first in 92. In Wow. I I love that, by the way, that you and she have such so much trust built into your relationship that that she went, well, okay. <laughs> and and yes, trust and okay. trusted you. <laughs> she did. She's um I said, yeah, you know what? I said, you know what, you know how to handle that board of egg because she's with them, you know, uh-huh. she just retired after 35 years, you know. So I you know, you know how to do that. You know, but I know how to do this and I can see, you know, where they are, where they're going. And like I said, I did a little research and they're not just doing gigs and regular gigs as, you know, I'm going to be worried about. They're going to be doing big things where I'm going to want a percentage of those big things, you know, not be stuck at the salary that I'm on. So, um, you know, roll the dice. And like you said, you know, she rolled it with me because, you know, we've been a team for a while. (laughs) Uh, and and that that is a beautiful thing. It's it's really nice to have when you are, 
And she's a creative person in her own right, obviously. But when you are a creative, it's really nice to have a partner. It's so good to have a partner who supports your endeavors like that. And, and you support each other's, which is, which is amazing. So, yes. so, so, because I could talk about her all day. I mean, she was a principal <laughs> in, no, seriously, in a, you know, a principal working in the Board of Education in the Bronx. So she's, she's, she's seen it all and she's a tough wonderful lady. So I think that that also is, you know, her having that strength and that grit and that determination probably helped you some. Can you talk a little bit about that, about how that worked out with you being a professional musician and touring a lot and her being in the Bronx, you know, working? Well, luckily enough, thank God, that she comes from a musical family as well. Hmm. And not only just a musical family, but she comes from a family who grew up sort of the same way we did, listened to the same kind of music um, that we were. And right down to the quartet gospel. And there's not many people listen to quartet gospel. Mm -hmm. And they know all the groups, those groups I was naming you know, earlier. She, she knew all those groups. <laughs> they all grew up on those same groups. So she knew you know, a lot of what I was talking about when I would be talking, and if I would talk to someone else, they would have no idea what I'm saying and who uh -huh. I'm speaking. So that's, that was the beginning of it. And then, like you said, when we got together, we were sharing those same stories and, and some, some of those times, and we were like in the same circles when we were kids, but didn't know it, you know, and didn't know each other. Uh -huh. so, so that made for a, a great relationship. And not having to explain as much, you know, when I didn't bring home because she was with me when, you know, I wasn't bringing home, you know, a decent amount, you know, so she was understanding. And I was like, well, this one's a bad one, but you know, the next one, you know, it's going to be a good one, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And her working at the board of ed back then was our stability because, you know, no matter what, that was that was happening and if i fell short she was right there you know have my back so when i was when i when i came up you know she, it was so easy to you know bring her on with me because we were a team like from way back then she understood the, the game she understood the business you know she understood you know what i'm going through with the traveling you know a lot of times her working for the board of ed gave her two months off so she's been around the world too. <laughs> she's been around the country and she's been around the world. So, uh, and, and now that she's retired, probably it, when, when we can travel again, uh, <laughs> yeah. she, she comes with you right now that she's retired. Yeah. Does she, ah, oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. She comes, she, she makes a lot of trips with me now, you know, but, um, you know, if it doesn't get back to where the way it was, which you know can't be exactly the way it was, but right. she's, she's you know she's had some some, some countries and uh, cities and states under her belt. We just before the pandemic, we were traveling. We were at Seattle. Mm -hmm. We did a, a Christmas run out there, and just before we went overseas, she was um, there. But we were going to Australia, New Zealand, and she had been. To those places with me and vowed never to take that long flight again <laughs> <laughs> and it is a long one for sure for sure yes so so then you, you you began your association with the blind boys of alabama and you've played you know for two different presidents you've done all of these things can you talk three. about three? Oh, i thought it was just obama and george w bush who's oh, clinton i guess Yes. Ah, okay. So yeah, sorry. My, I, I usually try to do my research better than that and obviously did not, <laughs> did, not, did not succeed as well as I'd like. So but it wasn't an official White House visit. It, uh, um, it was for the National Endowment for the Arts. Ah, but, okay. So Hillary was um, heading that up. So he was just there. Ah, yeah. Oh, there's Bill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, Jane Alexander and the uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, they kind of, they were heading that up. That's cool. That's very cool. So, so what are the highlights? Talk to me about a little bit, if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind about the highlights of, of playing with the blind boys of Alabama, what are, what have been the, the pinnacles of the long 
decades long association with with this band for you well coming in in the 90s um i didn't i didn't know as much about them on their worldly stage as that i should have mm-hmm. you know i just knew them from like the quartets i was naming before and mm-hmm. they were just one of them. they were just one of them mm-hmm. you know i grew up on knowing but um as i started traveling with them like the other quartets we would be t- singing at um uh, predominantly black audiences and we would be at you know maybe civic centers or um auditoriums things like that churches stuff like that mm-hmm. and with the uh blind boys you know my first gigs they were um sort of in clubs and you know festivals things like that and mm-hmm. i hadn't so i had wasn't used to that kind of thing and then as time went on um it was like i said that national endowment for the arts thing came about mm-hmm. and this was sort of kind of when i first got with them and we went to White House. That's when Monica was there too. And we did the sound check and everything. And between sound check and showtime, the tour manager came to me and said, um, I have some good news, you know, and some other news. But they said, what? Well, we, we're getting um, $10,000 for, um, for this award, for this award. And we would give you a thousand, but the only way that you're gonna get you know, you're, everybody has to have on a uniform, a, you know, the suit. And mm-hmm. this is the suit we're wearing. And if you have one of these, you know, you, you know you'll get your, your split. You know, so I didn't know if he was playing. I didn't know at the end. But Monica and I, we were in D.C. Monica and I hit Georgetown. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, we were all over those streets looking for that same color suit, shirt. And that's all we needed was the if we can find a suit and shirt, we'd be fine. And sure enough, we found it was a teal green suit. <laughs> <laughs> and we found the exact suit. Oh, it <laughs> yep, it was only two hours in between sound check and we had to be back because you know, security and all that around the right. White House. So we only had a two hour window. We drove to Georgetown and went shopping and found it and um, uh, pinned it up, <laughs> ironed it, and sure enough, <laughs> we had it. And I brought the thousand back to the room and we were, we were all excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was um, one of the big times, that was the first time ever being in the White House. And then uh, obviously we went back again with George Bush and for Obama, where President Obama, both of them, was um was exciting because um president bush was you know like kind of nicer and down more down to earth than you know we thought they were joking around he was joking around with uh clarence and jimmy about you know uh posing with his wife you know for laura he was like um you know hey i, I got my eye on you down this you know things like that and then um uh with president obama when we did that as we were taking pictures and when, when we were leaving you know, we're shaking hands and I, I reached out my hand to um, Michelle Obama and she said, no, we do hugs here. Oh. And I, yeah, and I was like, oh my God, is anybody watching? <laughs> 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 is the camera rolling? Oh my God, I can't believe it. So yeah, so we did that and we actually performed, you know, uh, we performed on stage that night and, and to see him and his wife and his mother-in-law and the two children you know, standing up and, and clapping and getting into it. You know, it was, um, that's been a big thing. And that, and that the White House that day, well, I think we were there with like Bob Dylan, and John Cougar Mellencamp, and uh, it was quite a few of them uh, mm-hmm. there with us. So that was exciting in itself. But um, there's been so, so, so many playing with um, the, the people on stage, different, different uh, artists. You know, I just, it's, that's just a, just a list of, Things with Peter Gabriel, like opening for Peter Gabriel and then actually performing. You know, Peter Gabriel actually came backstage on my birthday in New York, you know, where the Nets play, uh, where they used to play in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. And we're at that arena and we're um, backstage on my birthday. 
when we're coming on stage, you know, he's telling the people and he said, and today is Joey Williams' birthday. I'm like, oh, 20,000 people. I was like, um, you know, screaming for my birthday. And, and he's the one who sang it, Peter Gabriel. And then, wow. Uh, yes. And that wasn't enough. When we came off stage, we were all excited about backstage, you know, I have my sisters there, you know, or, you know, my family's there. And he comes backstage rolling a car. And it's like him with a birthday cake on it with the happy birthday. So now everybody was singing happy birthday to me backstage, led by like, Peter, Peter Gabriel. <laughs> yeah, you know, that kind of thing. So, oh, so wow. all of these, yeah, you know, singing with Willie Nelson on stage with Willie Nelson, Tom Jones. You know, and I'm I'm like um, the band director, so I'm like one on one with them, like telling them what verse they should sing. I'm telling Stevie Wonder what verse to sing and where to play his harmonica. I mean, you know, those those kind of things. I would never would have a chance to even be in in the company of those people, maybe. Mm -hmm. But not only that, but I'm kind of directing them. You know, like when. Uh, other bands like you know these big bands like preservation hall preservation hall and different ones i'm directing them paul schaefer when we were on you know like back in david letterman days mm -hmm. you know paul schaefer and um what's the name pam i think they sat in with us mm -hmm. you know he played organ with us on people get ready you know it's like um i grew up watching david letterman every night and watching the band and looking at those guys just you know loving those and idolizing them and then now he's playing with me and i'm telling him no not that change this change <laughs> oh, amazing goodness you know those things so things like that man it's just um you know just i can't even you know, like i said so many of those different occasions with so many different artists you know i just don't know where to begin and end ah oh. It sounds absolutely incredible. And, and you know what's, what's interesting is what you just said, really, it reminds me about something about myself. I am uh, I'm uncomfortable meeting my idols unless we're on an even playing field. Like if we happen to meet at a party, you know, or if we're both professionals in the same situation. But otherwise, I don't want to ever fangirl at somebody. I don't want to go, hi, I really love you work you know right and so so it's interesting that what you just said about you know you grew up idolizing the the guys on the, the the band on the david letterman show and then suddenly your peers you know you're right. you're working with them and that must have been quite quite an experience to to be there and to really to be like yeah this is this is how we do things and this is let me help you and you were able to help paul schaefer sound better you know and i think that's that's amazing Unbelievable! I, I also played along with them as well. Oh. <laughs> I sat, I sat in with them at home many times too. <laughs> I love it. You, you were their guitarist. <laughs> I was before they knew it. Right. <laughs> well, sometimes it works that way. So, so I know that you have focused a lot on on gospel music, but but do you obviously because you like you sat in with Paul Schaefer and the band, as it were. Uh, on when they were on TV, what other types of music do you play? Um, I, I, I can play all kinds of music, you know, mm -hmm. um, play blues, um, you know, play a little, little country, um, not a real jazz guy, um, play some folk. I just play, I just play guitar. So whatever, you know, like if I'm in a genre and I'm somewhere and we're like, I have been many times and we're just picking along or, somebody asked me to sit in, I can kind of sit in and adjust to whatever and, you know, whatever they're playing and whatever mm -hmm. style they're playing, because that's how I grew up. I grew up, I guess, maybe from playing, sitting in at home, maybe mm -hmm. that's it. But people would call me mm -hmm. up and, and would play with them mm -hmm. just anytime before I knew anything about like, like coming up to sit in, like, you know, like we do uh, famously now, people come and sit in with people. Well, before that, this is what I do, but they were hiring me to come with no rehearsal. I'm not with their band or anything, but they were, I'm at a show, the same show they're on, mm -hmm. playing with the band that I'm with. They would ask me to come play, you know, and pay me to play along with them. Mm -hmm. And this is, what, this is what I used to do on the quartet circuit for years. Um, mm -hmm. 
all of these bands I named before, like the Violin Airs, the Twenty Quintet, the Jubilees, uh, Tommy Ellison, the Five Singing Stars. I mean, the um, uh, who else? I said the that's what Key knows. My cousin Joy. I said those. So all of those, Darrell McFadden and the Disciples, the Sons of Glory. <laughs> all, <laughs> all, I mean, there's a host of group. My father's group was the Northern Airs, is where I started. You know, in the beginning. So I would do all that and all of those groups, I would be on shows and they would just ask me to come up and um, just play for them, you know, out of nowhere with no rehearsal and stuff. So that's what I was accustomed to doing. So when I was able to do that, I got, when I first got with Robert Randolph, we were playing in Boston and the Blind Boys were in Boston and Robert Randolph and the family band, they were in Boston, but they were playing a y- much younger crowd mm-hmm. and much later we our gig was at eight and done by nine fifteen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> his gig was starting at like 11 ah. 30 or something like that so um so we had already we had just did the higher ground cd mm-hmm. recording together so we had played together you know um at the studios but um not after that mm-hmm. well i went over to his place and i said well um which song do you want me to um sit in on and he said um you know what just 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 come up from the beginning i said from the beginning <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that show i didn't know none of that stuff yeah just come up from the beginning and i played the whole show and um from that day on you know i was kind of with the band once we got together again mm-hmm. promoting the high ground td i would come out and play with them as well and then that started the whole thing and that was back in 2002 and from that day to this one I've been with them and that's like my two those are my two like you know really uh, steady gigs wow okay I have so many questions <laughs> <laughs> so so okay so someone invites you to come and sit in uh, do they give you the keys or do you just automatically know? Is is there like, oh, this is the genre that we're playing in and we're going to be playing in these keys pretty much? Or it, it, like the you just happen to have a huge repertoire? How does that work? Well, back then, um, they didn't give, they wouldn't give me the keys, but before each song, mm-hmm. if, you know, I would get the keys from them if there was time. Mm-hmm. If not... If not, the song would begin and I would find the key because I play by ear. Mm, okay. Most of the year. So the song would begin and I would find the song and then I would hear the changes. When the changes go, I, I'd hear the changes and go to the changes uh-huh. with them. And back then, uh, some of those, um, with some of those groups I was talking about sitting in with, I knew some of their songs. Mm. Right. And a lot of them, the ones I sat in with, it was an honor and a privilege, you know, for me to even, you know, be on the stage with them, you know, and I was idolizing all of those groups I named mm-hmm. and, and more. Um, so I would, I would already know a lot of their songs anyway, and I would just be playing along with them and adding, I guess, a little flavor to mm-hmm. it. I had no particular lines. I wasn't doing like the horn line or the string lines or the piano, nothing like that. I would just play whatever I wanted that I think, you know, fit mm-hmm. and just so happened, you know, they like that. And that's, that's what they kept hiring me for to put that extra thing, you know, to what they're doing. Right. That extra flavor. The that extra, extra flavor. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a, it, it is a, it is a spice in that way because you weren't, you weren't overpower anything. You were, you were adding to it without being too, much you know and that that's that's a right. real major talent and skill i think because <laughs> there, there are lots of people who who will join in and sit in and be like i'm the star <laughs> that's right yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. that's right <laughs> and that and that can be kind of challenging because you're like and all of a sudden the song's gone into a direction we weren't thinking it was gonna go right uh, that, no that happened i've been in, i've been in bands where i've been the guy to come in on the side but then there's there's another guitarist that's, that's already there. Mm-hmm. So, and, you know, I had I would notice that instead of playing, you know, just rhythm, you know, he would start playing rhythm and lead and he just started playing a lot more stuff, mm. you know, just, you know, I guess, <laughs> you know, 
you know, that kind of thing. So you run into that kind of stuff too. Yeah. You know? And and music is a dance in that way. You really have to know who's who's leading. <laughs> mm-hmm, right. mm-hmm. And I'm always out of the way, but you know, there's you know, uh, people maybe you know they're just uh, I don't know. It, it, I you know it, it's uh, in the creative process. I think whenever you're collaborating, it becomes it it really is is a it's going to have to be a conversation. You know, like when you're always. playing, it's got to be a conversation. Otherwise, it can get it can devolve into cacophony. So I want to, I want to ask you something about gospel music before we move on, because there's some, again, I don't want to, I know you have a life to get back to, but, but I'm like, I want to ask you more questions. So is there, is there a more traditional sort of gospel music versus a more modern sound? Or is it basically, well, basically, I guess the question is how has the sound of gospel music evolved over time? Well, it has evolved, and there is still a, tr- a traditional gospel style, and there's a contemporary gospel style, but then there's many different styles of uh, gospel mm-hmm. now. I mean, I mean, as far as like rap, there's gospel rap, there's um, heavy metal gospel, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, there's, um, you know, symphonic you know, gospel, there's, you know, so that everybody has their own kind. Uh, not everybody has their own kind. Of, there are different um, genres in the gospel music itself. Mm-hmm. So, the uh, elevation, I don't know, It's but it's always been s- sort of contemporary. You know, you had people like Andre Crouch back, you know, back in the day. You know, Andre Crouch and, and the Hawkins family and stuff like that. And then right along with them, you had, you know, the, uh, the Dixie Hummingbirds and, and, uh, Mighty Clouds of Joy, and, you know, Blind Boys, and Swanee Quintet, those things, people like that. Then you would have Shirley Caesar and the Caravan, you know. So there's always been different kinds of, of music with um, the Brooklyn All-Stars, you know, and James Cleveland, you know. So there's, <laughs> you know, so there's different, you know, because one was singing like with choir, and one and, and one is singing like with a hip slapping type of quartet thing, mm-hmm. and then one is singing like, like an R&B type of, with an R&B type of feel, mm-hmm. you know, but um, it's always, but everybody always finds a way, you know, and then everybody's talking about the same thing, you know, right. so, and that, yeah, so that's what, now, traditional, you know, it, it sort of lost its way mm-hmm. as far as um, radio, you know, wasn't getting a lot of radio play and still not like quartets. You know, no radio plays, just kind of one kind of set music, gospel music, and that's whatever is picked. Same thing with all all the, you know, popular music now, you know. Seems like um, whoever's, you know, choosing the music, they choose it, and that's what's going to be heard, Mm -hmm. you know, on the radio, period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, but the music is still going on, and like different, forms of gospel still going on you just got to find it well you know it's interesting with youtube and 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 various other platforms you can find anything you know you can find so so much such a variety and you can keep enriching your musical world by listening to so many different kinds of music and you know different kinds of gospel like you said different different types of devotional music i i i don't i don't know if you have an answer for this but what's the difference between gospel music and spirituals? Um, I don't know the, the, the difference between, I mean, spirituals seem like to me, I mean, the difference that I can um, come up with is just like the age, you know, I don't know of um, spiritual, uh, spirituals of today, mm, mm-hmm. you know, you know, I think spirituals were more, like speaking uh, of the pain, sort of, of what's going on, mm. you know, and the gospel sort of was like, you know, good news. It was like um, singing and, and, and celebrating or, or, you know, it was just, just spreading. I think spirituals were done and created out of, you know, out of the pain and I need you to hear this because, mm-hmm. um, you know, this needs to be heard and this is what I'm feeling type of, rather than gospel, I think 
it's singing about, you know, singing about our Lord or just, or, or singing praises, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. more or less, more or less praise. I mean, that's me, but I don't know. I'm going to have to look it up. Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting yeah. <laughs> it, it's an interesting question isn't it? because i i remember yeah. when i was in school i sang a lot uh we sang like good news um you know good news the chariots coming i remember and i'm going to sing when mm-hmm. the spirit says sing those kinds of songs mm-hmm. and they were referred to as spirituals as opposed to um let's see uh, ride the chariot some of that some of those songs Mm-hmm. They were all described as spirituals. They were not described as gospel. And, and so I, 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 it's, it's an interesting question to ponder, like which, you know, how, how, do, how does what we refer to music as change over time? And I think some of it is who's playing it, you know, like the musicians playing it, but also some of, the, some of it probably is the DJs on the radio get to sort of decide uh, what is going to be played. So, so and, then, and then that might drive what musicians tour and how how shows are done does that make sense to you like which do you think drives which do you think the musicians playing the music drives who gets to tour or does the audience drive the exposure or do the people on the radio or other places drive who gets more coverage i think the people on the radio Mm. drive who gets the coverage because it's easier to just turn on the radio and hear what's going on. And what goes on the radio is what goes on everywhere else. I mean, the, the hit that happens on the radio, that's what's gonna be heard on TV if they're using it in a commercial. If you license that out to a commercial, that's the song they're gonna use, the ones that's on the commercial, because it's a hit song, it's big. Now, in order for you to find the other songs that you like, you're gonna have to put some effort into it and go, you know, go download it go look it up on YouTube, you know, go purchase it. You know, you're going to have to have your own system going on. Just the radio is right there, you know, and it's, and it's easy. Mm-hmm. Let's drive it. But, I, you know, I'm not saying I'm, uh, you know, with that because I don't like being told what to listen to and, you know, and, and being led that way. And I like, you know, a, lot, a wide variety of music. I do. Mm-hmm. So, but it just seems like I just don't know how are we, you know, choosing the, you know, what's what's going to be a hit and what's not. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I, it's, I, I've never, in my life, thought of what you just said as a thing. But it absolutely is a thing that that when you listen to radio, you're being told what to listen to. Somebody else is deciding that for you. That yeah. is. You've just opened my eyes to something. And I used to be a DJ. So, so, right. so, but I remember even as a DJ, we had only two uh, our, uh, uh, choices uh, an hour of what we could play. They were our, they were our own, that, that were our own choices among the songs that were in the playlist. Everything right, else I was, was prescribed. I was going to ask you, now, did you just pick your whole, all the songs that you, you know, played on the radio? Not the at all. The ones that you liked? Oh. Yeah, no, no, not at all. There was a list, there was a playlist, and the playlist right. had to be played. But two two times an hour, you got to choose something among the approved playlist. And if you are a rock station, it's different than if you are an R&B station or a country station or an oldie station. There's still an approved playlist, and that's what you play. And then you get two options an hour of songs among the playlist that you get to play. But everything else was, you're going to play this, followed by this, followed by this, followed by this. So it was, right. it, was not, it was. Not even the artists, you know, get to choose. Yeah. And, <laughs> what, and, what song they want you to uh, hear. Yeah. And it's not even up to them. Yeah, that's so fascinating to me. I, you know, I was, I started being a DJ when I was in high school. So many, many years ago. And I never thought of what you just said. So I'm so grateful to you that you pointed that out. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody else is telling you what to listen to. So yeah. so being an explorer of music makes a lot of sense that if you want to see people live or if you want to learn more about the kinds of music that you want to learn about, you're going to have to get down and dirty with it and really get get into the exploration. So That's thank right. you for that, Joey. I really appreciate that. So I, I, I want to I wanna switch gears a little bit, if you would. Um, I'm, I'm always curious about improv when you're performing how much is there it, that's all prearranged and you've you've arranged the songs and this is how you do them versus how much room is there for breath 
and improv in what you're doing? Or is it pretty much, you know what the pocket is and that's what you play? Um, a lot of, especially me, a lot of is what I play is improv, mm -hmm. especially with the sitting in and mm -hmm. stuff. If that happens, you know, 90%, if I'm sitting in with somebody, it's 90% improv. Mm -hmm. I'm going off of what I hear and what I feel and what I hear the changes going and what I hear them um, coming back to and what I want to put there. So it's mostly improv what I do. Now, when I'm playing with somebody, same thing with, sort of the same thing with Robert Randolph, the family band. Um, there's a base basis, but then that whole gig is improv. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fun and, you know, and, you know, we got the basis of the song, but then it can, totally take on a life of his own and become a whole nother song. And then we would totally do a song where we've never done it before and we just make it up on stage. It's just he'll start playing something and we'll start playing something or and next thing you know we're doing the song. So a lot of it's there. With the blind boys, most of it is kind of set the songs are set and, and how they're gonna be sung, but the lead vocalist, they have free range. And they will say, you know, do something that's off the script. <laughs> mm. They're saying, you know, like they're singing the same song, but they can lead it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Same background is going to be mostly the same, but in that background, maybe one of the choruses, somebody's going to go, ah, and leading into the next round of it so, you know something like that mm -hmm. or maybe we go an extra round because we're really feeling it or if mm -hmm. somebody's doing a solo we'll go an extra round on the solo because it's feeling real good or something like that mm -hmm. or jimmy will call a song that we haven't done before because he's feeling it and we we have to play it so you know with with blind boys it's more you know 60 40 I'm probably with Robert Randolph and the family band. It's like um, 80. 80% <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> improv. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was, I was doing a gig. Uh, I was singing uh, Yezu Joy at a, at a wedding and I was playing with a band. I was singing with a band I'd never played with before. And I was just coming in to do the, the vocals and the pianist messed up a little and played a whole bunch of extra measures that he wasn't supposed to play. And you know, that song just repeats and repeats and repeats. So, mm -hmm. so I'm like, I'm singing and I'm going, okay, all of a sudden I'm having to repeat part, like three, three bars of a verse. Cause then he realized the mistake. and it was this, how are we going to navigate it? And we, we were, were in a church full of 300 people and we had to navigate it on the fly. And so it's, it was really interesting. We all sort of had to trust each other. And it sounds to me like that's, that's a lot of what happens when you're on stage is that you just trust the other musicians that you're with and also listen like crazy. That's, you know, listen like a hawk, if you will, to what's happening and what you can anticipate. Can you talk about how that works a little bit? Well, yeah, you do. You um, you lean on the other person, especially if you know if you know the person, if you know the musician you're playing with. That's the, you know that's a whole other story. That's that's what you want. Someone that you know, like I play with musicians that all I have to do is like look at them, you know, mm -hmm. or drudge your shoulder, you know, and they know what's coming next. Or lean and I can lean that way, and I was like, oh, this is a passing chord, or you know, that kind of thing, or. Mm -hmm. Think that so don't you trust that they're gonna be there you know and and, and hear what you're saying mm -hmm. without you telling them mm -hmm. you know so having a lot of trust is 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 very pitiful in that now once we do the scariest thing about that and, and improv and and not being so structured when we have to play with an orchestra Mm. You know, when we play with a band, a house band or something that's written out our our um, music, mm -hmm. and we're just there, you know, then we did Carnegie Hall with um, the Roots. Mm -hmm. they, were the, they were like the house band. Mm -hmm. And they're playing, but they got it all written down. So if we go an extra <laughs> measure, it's throwing everybody off. Right. But some bands can adjust to that. Mm -hmm. playing with the Philharmonic, a symphony orchestra, 
is the most scary because you missed that, you know, line or there is no doing like a, I'm just going to say it one more time and just do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're not. So, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no. So those are the scariest time because we've had to do that uh, many times and the guys weren't used to, you know, like if, you know, the, even if you skip a beat, mm -hmm. everything is, is thrown off. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, we have to trust, they have to trust me, you know, as they're singing to not let them go astray. You know, even if they start on the wrong time, they trust me to go, hey, no, you know, to over shout, you know, to, to take over that line mm -hmm. and, and put it in the right place. And then mm -hmm. they would continue on. Right. Yep. So they have to, you know, so they have to have the trust in me. So we trust is a, a major, you know, factor mm -hmm. in that. Oh, absolutely. And you know, it, you know, get back to the one, just get back to the one, find the get one. Get back to the one, yes. <laughs> you know, and, and it's so scary because, you know, they're from the old school. So now they're not counting like that, you know, right. not, you know, so, you know, they just know how the song goes, right? you know, and how it feels. And I mean, they count on the inside, but not, you know, where if the count is off, you know, they know they have to start on, no, if the count is off, they just keep going. Right. And, everybody catches up <laughs> right? <laughs> because that's what you got to do. Yeah. That's no. And, and yeah. And it's again, that, that trust and that, and it's almost a flexibility of fluidity to the music then that you, you sort of have to go, okay, so I'm not going to be doing what I thought I was going to be doing. Now I have to do something totally different and, and make it work and, right. and make it, make it look and feel seamless, which is, which is a challenge when you're playing with, with a number of other people, but I right. want to, I want to ask you something that that I got to watch you play up close and personal at the Sophisticated Psychos Experience, and in watching you play, I felt like you were both there and not there. And I wanted to know where do you go when you're playing because you didn't feel like you were all there; you were somewhere else. Do you understand what I mean? I do. I do. I've I've been I've been that way uh, a couple of times. Um, I'm playing. Sometimes, you know, you lose yourself in a particular song or in a particular melody or a particular chord structure, and and it's and it's feeling good to you. I remember playing um, my first acoustic recording, mm -hmm. and, and this was with um, one of my uh, local groups from New York. We came up together, mm -hmm. and um, and they're. Um, called Darrell McFadden and the Disciples, DMD. Mm -hmm. It's still going right now. So mm -hmm. but back then, but yeah, you know, but you know, we all came up you know, locally together in mm -hmm. New York. And I was in the booth recording mm -hmm. and, you know, they had the lights down and stuff like that. But then midway the song, I didn't realize, you know, I, where I was, you know, I forgot they were all there, you know, I forgot you know, um, that I was in that studio doing that for them. I was just playing that song, mm -hmm. playing lines. It's my first time on acoustic, but playing it like it's like I've always, you know, like it's my hundredth time mm -hmm. feeling so comfortable. And I was, uh, I, um, I was away from there. Mm -hmm. I wasn't there, but it, I was loving it so much. And then when I, at the end of it, I came back and I couldn't even remember what it was, not remember, but didn't realize Mm -hmm. as I was playing it, what I was playing. Mm -hmm. So that was one of my first times of leaving where I was. And at that show, The Sophisticated Psychos, that happened too, because it was just uh, music going on. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of into what was going on at that moment and the, the, the chord changes and me trying to play. I was saying something and singing something through the strings at that time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it wasn't, um, I wasn't just jamming at that yeah. particular point. Yeah, yeah, it didn't feel like, like watching you, it didn't feel like it was just jamming. It felt like something else was happening. And I, I'm, I'm really, I'm grateful that you, that you uh, ex sort of elucidated what it was. Cause I was watching him like, he is just not here right now. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. I didn't stay long, but I left. 
I didn't yeah. say hello, but I thought I could say that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you did, obviously. And and that's the thing. I mean, you're you know, you're a master at what you do and you you trust your own body and your own your own musical spirit to be able to to do that, to let to let the the spirit of the music move you, which which it takes a very long time to to get to that point, I think, to get to the point where you can go, I just trust myself as a musician and I'm gonna I can I can leave, if you will, but the music will still be flowing because I it's so much a part of me and I'm so much a part of it. And I think that's that's uh, an important distinction that you you don't just do that. I think it the first time probably it happens to you and then after a while you're like, Okay, I can relax into it. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so I am curious as a master musician, how much do you practice? How much do you play every day? Well, now a little more than usual, uh-huh. <laughs> but uh, I have no choice now. Right. I'm home a lot. So I'm, I am playing a lot more and I'm teaching uh, now. So I have to play a lot more than I was on the road because mm-hmm. on the road, depending on the tour, I was playing every day anyway, whether mm-hmm. I was, you know, um, wanted to or not, whether I was practicing doing different things or playing my same thing. But I was mm-hmm. at sound check playing, and then I was at the show playing. Mm-hmm. So, so on the road, you know, I, I, I play enough to not have to practice, you know, all during the day. But mm-hmm. yeah, I practice average. I don't practice as much as I should. That's for sure. A lot of my guitar contemporaries will tell you that. <laughs> 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 but um, you know, now I'm getting better, guys. So I'm I'm home <laughs> practicing a lot more than I I have been. That's so funny. <laughs> it's, I'm looking. <laughs> I'm in my studio right now, and I'm and I'm looking at my guitar, which is looking back at me accusingly because I have not been playing as much as <laughs> as much as I would like to play too. Uh, <laughs> and, and you know, and and yeah, when you're on tour, you're you're obviously playing every every night all the time. Mm-hmm. So, so that, and that is such a, that's such a beautiful uh, way of like, like my husband said, and I were talking, you, you remember Rich, he and I were talking about getting in shape and, and he's like, you know, the best way I like getting in shape when it doesn't feel like I'm trying to get in shape when I'm just running around so much and riding my bike all over the city. And then all of a sudden I'm in shape and, right. and I'm like, right. yeah, that's yeah. it because you're, you're playing, you're doing that's gigs. Me. Yeah. That's me. Yes, yeah. I swam yesterday. You know, because swimming doesn't seem like I'm exercising. Right. Uh, it, well, it's a great exercise, though. Yeah, it's you're playing in the water. So I, I wanna I wanna ask you uh, yes a few more questions, and I thank you for giving me so much of your time. Um, this is a this is an unusual this is an, an unusual question. I as a musician and as a creative, I think you see the world differently, and I'm and I would love to to sort of ask you about how you see the world. How, how do you imagine you see the world differently than someone who is not either or not a professional musician or someone who's not pursuing a creative life? What do you think is the difference between someone who is pursuing one and someone who is not? Oh, the difference, how we see the world differently. Mm-hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um. No, I not really, because I, the way I, I mean, the way I see the world, I, because I don't know any other way. Yeah, I know. I'm asking you to slit into two people right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I wonder how this person would see it. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I do. I, I don't know if this is the reason why, but I see everything positive. I mean, I always see a lot of positive. Mm-hmm and and things you know i don't know if that's because of um, my musicianship or what i or my artistry i don't know if that's the reason but yeah i see you know i'm always optimistic you know always see you know the brighter side mm-hmm. the more positive side you know and i think that first before other things mm-hmm. and i know people who are totally opposite you know mm-hmm. the first thought would be the negative thought or you know if this person comes up to you he, he can't be up to any good mm. or if i offer you this then something must be wrong with it or you know different things like that you know it's it's, it's 
they said it was going to be sunny, but I don't know. Hmm. You know, that kind of thing. And I'm, and I'm the guy that's like, well, it's probably going to be sunny, you know, or, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's probably cool, you know, unless I see something that tells me different. Right. Or, you know, so things like that. So that's the only thing I can see, but I can't blame it on, you know, being an artist or being creative and not being. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it is an interesting thing to think about that you're more open to possibilities and it's possible that it's because in part, at least because you're an artist and a musician. Uh, And, and there's another, there's another thing that I want to talk to you about music real quickly. Music to me is the universal language. You can be dropped anywhere in the world. And if you can play music, people, the people around you and you will have a, a way of react of connecting and reacting to each other. And so as part of the Blind Boys, you've traveled, as you mentioned, all over the world. How, how different is it when you're playing in a place where you and your audience don't speak the language, the same language as in, you know, you don't all speak English or whatever, versus when you do? Is there a difference? And if so, what do you think it is? Um, it's not much of a difference. Okay. Um, the, the audiences, they react basically the same. You know, um, the, speak, the people that speak English, um, they may, you know, like interact with the talking part of it or, or laugh, you know, laugh at the joke, Jimmy or Clarence or, you know, whoever may tell, mm-hmm. um, things like that. But for the most part, um, the music, they, they all react the same and they all feel it the same. There's places we go like you said, when they don't understand what's going on, they don't understand a word we're saying, but um, you can tell they, they feel it. You know, there, there are places we go, like uh, Morocco or, you know, different places, Lebanon, where, you know, the religion, you know, is, is, is Muslim, you know, and they asked us not to say certain words, Jesus, or, you know, certain words they, they asked us not to say, mm-hmm. of course, old school you know especially back then Clarence you know if you didn't want us to sing gospel you shouldn't have called us you know that Mm -hmm. kind of thing (laughs) Mm -hmm. so he's like so he's you know singing so but they get into it there's no troubles and everybody's on their feet and you know you know they stand there and bite us bite us back we've done you know Fez Morocco a couple of times and Mm -hmm. um, you know we've been back to these places and in Japan and one particular night we came off stage and we we're backstage after we finished, you know, you know, the house, you know, we really did good. And they let a couple of the people come back. And this one young lady was, was like crying and, you know, she was speaking in, in um, Chinese, no Japanese. And she was, we got somebody to translate and she was saying, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but I, you know, I'm feeling, I can't, you know, and um, Clarence like, well, we know what it is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's always good. So uh, I don't know if every artist is like that, but as far as we go, that's how it goes. We are received so well by so many different languages and so many different people, so many different countries. You know, I, I, I can tell that I can't tell the difference really from the English speaking and non and American and uh yeah that's so lovely it it, it really is a communicate music communicates no matter where you are and i think that's no yeah that's such a such a beautiful wonderful concept it it will speak to people no matter where you are i want to switch gears just a little bit again and ask you what is the best first step in learning the guitar what if someone found an old guitar in their attic what's the best thing they can do to start um, learning how to tune it. <laughs> uh, make sure it has all the strings. <laughs> yeah, um, all the strings, and finally, nowadays you can you can do that. You can t- you can tune it because there's the new technology, so it's a lot easier now mm-hmm. than then. But uh, we had a pitch pipe, mm-hmm. which we tuned with. But um, my father started me 
with an A chord. And that's how I got started with um, like a, a regular A chord mm -hmm. and learning to go from, you know, A to, to the change. We call those the changes, which is A to D and mm -hmm. to E. Mm -hmm. You know, those, that's how, so just a chord. That's if you have, if you find one up in your attic now, just learn a chord. It doesn't have to be an A chord. My first chord was A. But you can always find a chord and learn that chord. And from then, you'll be okay. I love it. I love it. The, the A, to, A to D to E, the one, four, five is world yes. famous. World, <laughs> it's famous. world, world famous. That's and, right. Yeah. And I think you're right. I think just, you know, in some ways you tune it and then start strumming, see what happens. And, and that will, that will get you somewhere. I, I, and in that, well, the, the E, the best way to learn if you find one now uh -huh. is to go to live lesson masters. <laughs> <laughs> wait wait is that by any chance where you're teaching is that you know what, you know what? if you ask me i might be there but i'm just telling you i'm just saying you know <laughs> that's, well, you go. that's right well <laughs> and actually i'd love i'm going to want to put the link to it and also all of your social media for all of your many new fans uh i want to put the link on the show notes page so definitely i want to i want to make sure i have that <laughs> <laughs> before we leave because no because it's true you know there there's there are some people who learn on their own but there are very yeah. few far between you know a, a lot of people will need somebody to guide them if only to guide them on technique that won't kill their hands you know right. i, I right. remember i remember when i first started learning the guitar my my guitar teacher um who i just actually had on the just recorded his podcast chat do you know a, a, a guitarist named al petaway have you ever heard of him al yeah, he's a. He's a. Yeah, he familiar. Yeah, he's a finger style guitarist, and he's he's uh, he's another Grammy winner like you. <laughs> That's oh. All you Grammy winners, you're a dime a dozen, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. No. Uh, so they're all over the place. Yeah. So yeah, and he he gave me some lessons, and one of the first things he said to me was, "Stop pressing so hard. You're gonna kill yourself." And and I thought that was. That was lovely, and, and it helped. It helped yeah. me learn. Um, so, a, a, a couple other things for the guitar heads in the group. What do you play now? What guitar do you play? What strings do you use? What pickups? And and most importantly, what makes a guitar good to you? How do you know a guitar is a guitar you'll want to play? Well, my favorite guitars are uh, Fender Stratocaster. That's the, my go-to, and I've been playing one particular guitar for uh, for quite a while now, and it's a Fender Strat. I think it's for the improv show, and uh, I use light gauge strings, which is double O nine, and in the business we call them nines. So I go, I use nines to. 42. So not too light, but light enough. 11's too heavy for me right there with the 9's so I can bend a lot and mm -hmm. thrum a lot. And I also play Duesenberg. I've been playing Duesenberg for quite a few years as well. And Actually, my red Duesenberg that I have here, Prince actually played that guitar. So Prince played uh, the guitar. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. He played. He played. Um, he came on stage, and um, he actually played my guitar for a few minutes, and handed it back. And that wow. stage. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Uh, very cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, just, just some guy. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. Oh, goodness. Um, well, all right. So 
I, there's, I, I could, I could keep talking to you all day and I hope that you'll come back and, 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 and be on the show again. Cause this has been such a delightful conversation. I, I, I want to ask you just, just a couple more questions if it's okay with you. Um, what, what are you curious about right now? What are you, what are you interested in? Especially now, you know, we're not, we're, most of us are staying at home a lot. What's got you going, Ooh, I want to learn more about this. Uh, social media. Uh huh. I want to learn more about social media and connecting with people through social media uh, because it seems like, um, well, not seems like it's definitely the way in the way of the future. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to get that going and reach out to more people and trying to because I've been kind of doing. I want to do what you're doing as well. I'm, I'm interested in like podcasts or, you know, because I know so many people mm -hmm. and I've been in contact with so many people and kind of, in a, in a way that not just, you know, like in their band or playing with them or grew up with them or, you know, it's, it's, I meet them in ways like kind of with the blind boys for, for the most part. Mm -hmm. so I would like to talk to you know, a lot of them are, you know. So um, social media is what I'm kind of interested in doing. And I want to do more like recording. I want to, I'm interested, like in the engineering part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a little late. Some of my friends are saying right now, it's a little late for that. <laughs> oh, why is that? I don't know, you know, because I'm so old. <laughs> oh, no, no. You know, the beauty of all the technology out there, you can... You can do, you can, you can pick that stuff right up and just, and run with it. And because you're already an inquisitive soul, it's going to, yeah, I have, I have no doubt that if you want to do it, you'll do it. And, and podcasting, I'll make you the offer that I've made to Katie and I helped her get her podcast up and running. When you're ready, I'm happy to help you get your podcast up and running. <laughs> Not a problem. Cool. cool. Yeah. So I want to, yeah, I want to do more, you know, more of that kind of stuff and, like I said, doing engineer, like recording, knowing my, you know, knowing the board and stuff like that, that kind of, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. because, so that's what I'm kind of into now and fascinated with the social media stuff, getting out to the fans. Yeah. And, and it's a way of communicating and interacting with people who otherwise you'd never have the opportunity to interact with. So, mm -hmm. which is a, which is a wonderful thing. All right. Well, yeah. I, 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 students are from, uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. A lot of my students are from, you know, like different places, like overseas, and they were fans. A lot of them are fans mm -hmm. that were calling me in just to talk, mm -hmm. get my stories on what, you know, what, how was it like, you know, working with Tom Waits and, and, and this and that. So um, it's a great way to, to be in touch with the fans that even if we're on the road all the time, we mm -hmm. don't go back to that certain, that particular country for two years or four years sometimes, you know. Right. So it's, a, it's another way to reach them until we get there. Right. Absolutely. And it's it's a way to keep keep that relationship growing, which, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm going to encourage you to listen to next week's episode because next week is going to be T. Morris, just so you know, and he wrote literally the book called Podcasting for Dummies. Wow. Like, like he's the, he is the author of that book. <laughs> so, and he does a lot with social media. So I'm going to definitely tag you when, when his episode comes out, it'll be out a week yes. late after yours, but yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot to learn. And it's, it's so amazing to me that we can reach out and connect with so many different people who otherwise we would never have access to and who would never have access to us. So I think that's lovely and wonderful. I have just one last question and I do oh, real quickly. Let me just say your social, your Twitter and your Instagram, your Twitter at twitter.com slash day J W I L L six string. So J will Joey Williams six string and your Instagram is instagram.com slash Joe will 17. And I'm going to put those on. I'm going to put that on the show notes so that, and also with your lessons and everything. So okay. that people will be able to, to, uh, to get in touch with you and follow you. And is there anything else that you want people to know before I ask my last question? Any other words of wisdom or advice that you want to give? Um, 
I just want everybody to sort of think, um, love, listen, and try to understand one another. That's basically what we all need to kind of do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. Okay. That's well, it. <laughs> that's that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, Joey, I, I want to thank you once again for being on the show. This has been such a treat. And I, as I said, I hope you'll come back. I, I have sure. one one sure. last. Oh, yeah, I'm losing you again. Oh no. Oh you- hello. Oh, I can sort of hear you. Say again. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Testing, Uh, testing. One, two, three. Uh, So I, I, this is a strange little question, but I ask it of every guest I have. So I'm going to ask you too. And the last question that I have for you is if you had an airplane that was going to sky write something that the entire world could see, what would you say? Oh, I have to sky right what I just said. <laughs> be a big bowl of letters. Love, listen, and try to understand one another. And that is perfect. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joey, for joining me. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. Oh, well, it was so cool. And it's good talking to you again after so long. I know. It's been a while. We need to do this again yeah. soon. <laughs> yep, yep. For sure, for sure. And well, I'm going to be in touch about the podcast. Oh, good. I hope you are. I hope you do. I'm happy to help. So... Again, Joey, I want to thank you. And I want to say, um, if you have enjoyed this episode, if you're listening, get in touch, leave a review, find Joey Williams. You can find him on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. I'm going to put all of this stuff in the show notes. He is a master musician. And as you can tell, a super terrific person. He's a wonderful, creative man. And I'm so grateful. If you're enjoying these episodes, please leave a review of the show. Let me know what you're thinking. Comment, get in touch. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Creative Mindset Podcast, and I send you all of my love. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2020. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg and I send you all of my love.